I am so impressed by uh, this gentleman. Uh, I've read some of his work, not enough. He's written 30 books. He is in the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at Stony Brook University in an extraordinary scholarship. Stunning, really, if you take time to read this, and I hope some of you will. Um, and he is also, let me tell you right now, he is giving a lecture at Riverside Church, and that program is on November 6th and 7th. I might as well give you a phone number at this time. I'll repeat it. Please take the phone, take the pen out, 212-219-2527, extension 2. This is the number that you call to make reservations for listening to my guest, who is professor, as I said, of Asian and Asian American Studies, is the author of 30 books, five of them on one of the best-known Muslim Sufi philosophers, Spanish in origin, Ibn Arabi, and he is Professor William Chittig. Welcome to WBI, Professor Chittig. Thank you very much. Who is a Sufi? <laughs> this is a... <laughs> This, of course, to answer a question like this, uh, you have to see who's asking it in the first place. This is a, an extremely complicated question. Oh, so you're going to turn your microscope on me? Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. Go. <laughs> go. Yeah, not not just you. Uh, the, all uh, of I listeners. have the audience rather in mind. Oh, that's I, better. I, I that's suspect better. you're better informed than most people are. The, the word is very famous because of, uh, basically because of the poetry of Rumi, and people know that you know, Rumi is a famous uh, 13th century Persian poet, and he was a Sufi, and for other reasons as well. People normally associate it with mysticism, and most people think it's some sect or branch of Islam. Uh, but it's much more complicated than that. If you really want to understand what Sufism is all about, you first have to understand what Islam is all about. And so it goes back to, because uh, as far as serious scholarship is concerned, Sufism begins where the rest of Islam begins, and that is with the revelation of the Quran to Muhammad. Uh, basically, the Islamic tradition, like any religion, deals with three fundamental concerns. One is activity, how to act correctly. One is thought and understanding, how to uh, comprehend the world, the universe correctly. And the third is transformation of the soul, how to become closer to the ultimate reality, which in Islam is God, or is called God. Uh, so as Islam develops over the centuries, around about the third century, you start getting specialists in these three dimensions. Some of them are called jurists. They're the people who specialize in right activity, and they codify Islamic legal teachings. Some of them are called, called theologians and philosophers, and they specialize in codifying, or not, not quite codifying, but clarifying how we can think correctly and not make mistakes as we contemplate the world and ourselves. And some of them are called Sufis, and they're interested in the first two issues, of course, because the first two issues are foundational, but what they're really interested in is putting the first two issues, practice and understanding, uh, to applying them to the human soul so we can transform ourselves and become closer to God. So a Sufi is someone who's striving to become close to God on the basis of, of Islamic teachings, specifically the model of the Prophet Muhammad. I forgot to make an announcement that uh, in this program where Professor Chittak is a keynote speaker, uh, I would really strongly recommend you consider that. It's going to be held at Riverside Church on November 6th and 7th, a weekend. And let me give you that number again, 212-219-2527, extension 2. You can hear... Um, and see, Professor Chittick. Now, there's going to be another important speaker, and we are going to be privileged to have him here tomorrow, and he's Professor Muhammad Haj Yusuf. He's from United Arab Emirate, uh, Emirate and uh, so he would be calling from there. Let's come back to this. The idea of mysticism is a very old idea, 
And though I can't find or haven't been able to find a clear written reference to mysticism in the ancient African or East African tradition, uh, clearly in ancient Indian, for example, Mahabharata, there was a big focus on mysticism. Let's talk, uh, Professor Chetik, about the origin of Sufi tradition in the context of Islam. And then if you would like to um, uh, go a little further back, and uh, look into the ideas of mysticism in traditions which are actually older than Islam, from, from which Islam or the current tradition, Sufism, that we understand might have drawn from? The, uh, as far as the Sufi tradition itself is concerned, what you're referring to as mysticism is the fruit of, I suspect, the fruit of transforming the soul. And this quest to transform oneself and to become nearer to God and therefore to see clearly, not to simply follow other people's understanding and interpretation, but to see for yourself, to see reality as it is, which includes the vision of God. This goes back to Adam. This is in human nature. Every human being is created with the capacity to undergo transformation. And the first person to do it was Adam, the father of all. Remember, in the, in the Islamic retelling of the myth of Adam, Adam only uh, didn't even sin. He forgot, and he disobeyed a command. Then he asked forgiveness. He was forgiven, and he was appointed as a prophet. And so this notion that mysticism began somewhere in Islam is nonsense. It pertains to human nature. When we have human beings, we have an intimate connection with God. And that, look at from the outside, you call it mysticism. Otherwise, as you say, you look at the Greeks who gave us the word mysticism with their whole notion of mystery religion and myth. Also, the word myth is connected intimately with, with the root. The whole notion of mysticism in the Western tradition coming out of the Greeks is omnipresent. That is, nearness to the ultimate reality. Whether we're talking ancient India, ancient China, and for that matter, the developed traditions that began in very ancient times, and many, I mean, Islam is the youngest, absolutely the youngest of all these, and perhaps has, because of its youth, it was able to preserve uh, a sense of, of what? The, uh, the real essential teachings of wisdom, of God, uh, better than some of the other traditions, which got too involved with institutions and uh, social and political matters. So mysticism, or the heart of Sufism, is really our shared human heritage. Let's move on to some historical context. Um, where are the roots of the Islamic uh, philosophy of Sufism. How did it start? Uh, how soon after Prophet Muhammad's death um, back in 631? The, the problem here is the usage of words, right? right. If, you, if you insist on using the word Sufi, then you'll have to wait until uh, the second century of Islam before you find the word. And it's not being used yet is the meaning which we're trying to use it today. But the same thing goes for other words. For example, we talk about jurists in Islam. Most people, they think about Islam, they think about it law, and they think that law, the Quran, is all about law. That's nonsense. The jurists are a school of Islamic thinking which develop also in the second century, and they're the people who tell us that what the legal teachings of the Quran are. Theologians come into the picture around the second century. In the first century of Islam, there are very few historical records, but everything is kind of synthetic. It hasn't been developed yet. History is needed before you can see the various dimensions of Islamic teaching. So, but didn't Ibn Ishaq write the uh, history of uh, Islam really within 30 or 40 years of Prophet Muhammad's death? Is that not true? Pardon me? What happened? Ibn Ishaq, the, the celebrated Muslim historian. No, no, historian. no. He's quite a bit later than that. Okay. I thought he was around 30, 40, or possibly 50 years after Prophet Muhammad. Oh, no, no, no. I, okay. I mean, I, I can't tell you offhand his okay. date, right. but all of these people were writing. The, the books that we have basically date the earliest of the second century of Islam. Okay. 
the first century is very, uh, and of course, they're talking about the first century. They're talking about the life of Muhammad. Ibn Ishaq, the life of Muhammad is, you know, these are reports narrated from uh, the companions of the Prophet and then the followers of the companions, etc. You mentioned that it's important to talk also about what is not Sufism. So let's dispel some of the common misconceptions that in your scholarly work you've encountered? Well, I think the, the the worst misconception we have, and it's very common both in scholarship and especially in the popular perception of Sufism nowadays with people like Rumi, is that uh, Sufism is not real Islam. It's something that was added on later. Uh, and uh, it's the nice, you know, when, when, when uh, Muslims became... Uh, tired of too much law, they turn to mysticism. This is total rubbish. In fact, anyone with any sense, any taste for, I would say, spiritual matters or philosophy or metaphysics can see Sufism in the Quran. It's very, very clearly the issues, that is love for God, transformation of the soul, the quest for perfection. All of these are present in the Quran and in the sayings of Muhammad. And in the model of Muhammad, the most important mythic event in uh, Islamic thought in terms of human perfection, after the descent of the Quran, because God sent the Quran, is the ascent of the Prophet Muhammad to the presence of God. This is the completion of the descent. Once God sends the message, the Prophet assimilated the message and then traveled up to God. That is, of course, an extremely important event, uh, which uh, you know historians will poo-poo it. Nonetheless, in the terms of the uh, mystic understanding, the great big picture for Muslims, that is the culmination of the descent of the Quran, and that's what Sufis are modeling their activity on. They want to ascend to God in the footsteps of the Prophet. There is a general sense, um, I should say I've read and heard it, um, even in Pakistan, it's quite, um, uh, a lot of people believe in that, and uh, but they don't have your scholarship and your diligence. Um, and that is that Islam coming out of Saudi Arabia, when it conquered Iran, Persia was an old, old empire. They had great traditions. They had great libraries. And um, uh, there is, was, of course, the Zoroaster there. So the ideas of uh, humanity, the ideas of humanism, the ideas of mysticism, enlightenment, they were not foreign to the Persians. And as the Arabs came, they were basically nomads. Uh, they sort of offended the Persian sensitivity, to, so to speak. I'm presenting to you what I was taught, and I am interested in uh, your uh, your comments on it. So then Sufism was a sort of an impatience. They said, well, you know, we don't want to really go to so much to jurisprudence. We want to have a direct linkage with God. And so there's a well-known story of a Sufi, Rabia, uh, the best celebrated Muslim woman uh, as a Sufi. And uh, you know the story sure. um, that she's carrying a bucket of water and she's carrying a flame and somebody says, well, Rabia, where are you going? And she says, well, this water is to put out the fires of uh, hell and, the, and uh, the, uh, the flame is to burn heaven. So uh, this also allows me to ask you to talk about what was the position of women in terms of spiritual achieve, attainment uh, in public? And uh, how did the Arabs, uh, certainly after Prophet Muhammad's death, how did it change uh, so that we have a tradition of burqa? And what might have uh, Sufi women, for example, Rabia Basri, have contributed to this? <laughs> that was quite a series of questions here. The, the, the first is the Iranian nationalist position concerning Sufism. Iranians have a tremendous affection for Sufism. And they have, uh, from, in modern times, this is not, uh, this is not pretty modern. In modern times, they have, they have latched on to certain of the teachings of the Orientalists, who were the first person, the first ones, that is Western Orientalists, who hated Islam, basically. 
They considered Islam a barbarian desert religion. They considered it with no dimension of spirituality whatsoever. And they said the only explanation for the fact that we see beautiful examples of spirituality in Islam is that it must have been borrowed. Now, some Orientalists said it was, they took it from the Greeks. Some said they took it from the Hindus. Some said they took it from the Buddhists. Uh, the most popular position was they took spirituality from the Christians, and the Iranians take the position they took it from us. And, of course, uh, you know how the way that Iranian culture has always influenced Pakistani Indian culture, that is the Muslim country, yes, culture in India, of the subcontinent, is very, very strong. So that idea has been picked up from the Orientalists on the one hand and uh, the Iranian nationalism on the other. It also, as far as I'm concerned, has no historical, it has a certain historical basis, there's a certain logic to it. But, but you have to remember before you reach this conclusion that most of the jurists were also Iranians. Most of the theologians were also Iranians. The, now, it's true the Bedouins, the Arabs, did not have a culture of writing. They did not have a literate culture. That's, of course, is obvious. When the caliphate became established, they didn't have administrators. They, who, did, who took over the administration? They were Iranians or they were Christians, people, you know, local people who were very well educated. The Islamic sciences developed the same way. They developed the Muslim scholars who were, happened to be Iranian or maybe Byzantine of, of origin, got a hold of... The, the, the material and, 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 and developed its implications. So there's a, there's a certain truth in this that, yes, the Iranians were, were very, very adept at bringing out the intellectual implications of various myths, mythic teachings. Religion always appears in the form of myth. The Bhagavad Gita is a grand myth. It's also the greatest spiritual text of India, and it's been, you know, commented upon generation after generation. The same goes for the Quran. It's a great book of spiritual teachings. The people who receive it, who were now the Persians and, and Christians of the Middle East, former Christians, former Jews, <clears throat> these people read it, of course, in terms of their own background, and they saw in it all of the great spiritual teachings that they themselves liked in their own traditions, and this is natural because those teachings are there. So this is this Iranian notion, I think, is, is misguided. If it's, the idea is the Iranians didn't like Islam, so they remade it in their own image. So this is the Iranian nationalist position. Yeah, unfortunately, that is, um, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're exploding that myth. Now, I think our listeners would like to know that you spent quite a bit of time in Iran. Right? Yes. Please tell us about that a little well, bit. These were, of course, wonderful days before the fall of the Shah. The Shah, of course, had his negative sides, but we all have seen after the revolution that the Shah was, was no question, he was the lesser of two evils. The mullahs, having taken over, the situation in Iran deteriorated rapidly. I was there before the Shah left, and, it, it, and uh, so I was there for 12 years, which is quite a period of time, which means you know, I speak Persian like a native, I, and, and I read Persian uh, uh, better than most natives. Um, and this so meant, you did your doctorate I did also my there. PhD at Tehran University in uh, Persian language and literature. Uh, and in fact, that's where I began my studies, my very serious studies, textual studies of Sufism. Uh, so, now, in those days, Iran was a lovely, lovely country. It still is. The people are wonderful. The, 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 the environment is beautiful. But there wasn't any of this oppression. Nowadays, you go to Iran, and this has been the case at, since the revolution, people are quite afraid. People are you know, frightened of the government in a way they weren't uh, under the Shah. Uh, so it, it was a lovely time to be in Iran. And the Iranians are extremely warm people. They're, they're, they're nice people. They, they love guests. They would just treat you royally, and especially me, because they, hear, they would tell me when I met people, uh, especially common people, when I went to the bazaar, let's say, down you know, in the old part of Tehran to do some shopping, 
they would start talking to me, and it took them a while to realize I was not Iranian. And they would say, where are you from? I said, America. What are you doing here? I'm studying. Why do you come here to study? We send all of our children to America. They were surprised by this. They were amazed by this. And they just treated me, you know, with great respect and honor because I was studying their culture. And and that is really something that I think most people would be deeply reverential about. Um, I want to um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, um, the issue of Sufi women. So inform us, please. Um, and then after the mid hour, uh, we can take some calls, right? We'll open the lines and sure. okay. So talk to us about inform us uh, about uh, uh, Sufi women. And um, because in the minds of most people, when they look at today what's happening in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, the burqa and the, the lashes, I mean, this is awful. But uh, give us your view of that. Oh, I, I agree. It's utterly awful. And I think there's a tremendous distortion of Islamic teachings uh, going on here. Um, and, uh, I, you know, the, the, there's absolutely no excuse for it. There's no explanation for it other than stupidity, ignorance, self-centeredness. And, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it goes against, I would say, the whole tradition of Islamic teachings. The prophet, in a, you know, in a very famous saying, said the best of you is the best to his wife. That the, 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 you know, the, the best of you in terms of your moral and spiritual character is the one who treats his wife the best. And certainly he himself was a model of that good behavior toward his wife or his wives, as the case may be. Uh, but uh, And this, this was, of course, picked up. Now, this is a very complicated issue, of course. But uh, let me j- just say briefly can I, can that... I, he, can I share with listeners one little detail which they yes, probably please, like? That Prophet Muhammad's first wife, uh, Hazrat Khadija, when Prophet Muhammad married... Uh, he was her employee. He was 25. She was 40. And then uh, for the next uh, almost 25 years, uh, Prophet Muhammad did not marry again until the death of his wife. And he was, historical facts are very clear. He was so utterly devoted uh, to Hazrat Khatija. So please go on. I just yes, thought yes, the listeners might like to listen to that detail. Yes, well, it's an important detail. Um, the uh, Now the question of Women in Sufism, first of all, there's a notion still floating around that the Quran makes the distinction between men and women in terms of spiritual capacity. This, again, is no basis in the text. The fact is the Quran typically talks about men and women. It does use the, the ancient Arab custom of giving priority grammatically to, the, to masculine over feminine. We've always done it in English, too. Until feminism, we did the same thing. Uh, you know, uh, an unknown person was always a he. It's only recently you started to say he or she. Uh, but in Arabic, it was the masculine grammar, you know, grammatically took precedent. But the Quran, although it follows that, also repeatedly, when it starts talking about uh, the, 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 the men and women who are in the path of God, it explicitly says that the males and the females, using both the masculine and the feminine form of the noun. So there's absolutely no question that in the Quran, in terms of spiritual capacity, in terms of human nature, men and women are identical. There's no difference to be drawn. The only issue that that we have is that in terms of social uh, roles. And here... Advice is given, among others, that, that the family is the utter heart of human society and everything is to be done to encourage family life, and love between husband and wife, and raising of children and all these things. Now, in terms of Sufism, what you see is, uh, first of all, there's, there's no monasticism in Islam. It's very, very rare to find anyone. Rabbi, whom you mentioned, is an exception. Who wasn't married? Um, the, uh, most Sufis were married. They had wives who were themselves practicing. They were also engaged in the path. But in keeping with the social norms of that time, and until recent uh, times also in the West, the males were the ones who went out in public. And the females 
were the one who kept themselves relatively concealed. Going back to the linguistic, the word Allah, Al-Ilah, Allah, of course, refers to female gender, and the three primary deities of uh, pre-Prophet Muhammad, uh, Arabs, of course, were all women, Al-Manat, al us So there is a... Um, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm sure that our Muslim listeners are very happy to see you clarify these things and try to uh, dispense with these myths. We are at the mid-hour. Uh, we're going to take a quick station ID. Would you please stay with us, won't you? Of course. Shows. Well, which one do you want? Play anything. We don't want dead air. Remember, WBAI's fall membership drive runs from October 14th through November 7th right here at 120 Wall Street, 10th floor. To become a volunteer to answer phones during the drive, call Vera in advance at 212-209-2826 so your name can be entered in the security computer. See you during the drive. That's the promo you played? I thought it was good. Yeah, it was. And you can dance to it. Yeah. Welcome back to Science, Health, and Healing. This is your host, Marjit Delhi. This uh, week, we are devoting to deep healing, looking through the eyes of a Sufi. And uh, I mentioned earlier on that tomorrow we are going to continue this program with uh, um, Professor Muhammad Haj Yusuf. Uh, he is um, right now in United Arab Middle East, United Arab Emirate. And both my guest now, uh, Professor Chittick of uh, Stony Brook University, author of 30 books on the subject. He just told us earlier he spent 12 years and he fluently speaks uh, Persians, which puts him at a great advantage. And both of them are uh, speakers at this important conference uh, being held, uh, the title is Islam, Sufism, and Heart of Compassion uh, at uh, Riverside Church, uh, November 6th and 7th. The number for contact reservation is 212-219-2527. I hope that uh, most of you will try and pack this place. Professor Chittick and Professor Yusuf really need to be heard. Our number is 212-209-2950 for you to participate. Please limit your comments or questions to the subject of my guest. Uh, Professor Chittick, what is... Um, uh, I want to thank you, Chittick. I want to thank you for um, taking time out to join us. What is compassion? <laughs> in, you see, for my topic in this, in this talk is the anthropology of compassion. Compassion... In order to get at the root of compassion with the Islamic notion of, of compassion, we have to look back at the feminine. And uh, the, the way Ibn Arabi always does things is to go back to the roots of things in God. Let's understand what it means in the case of God, and then we can understand what it means in the human case. Now, in the case of God, the, the word I have in mind is Rahma. Rahma, for those who know Arabic, comes from the same root as Rahim. Rahim means the womb. Now, the primary names of God in the Quran is first Allah, of course, which simply means God and has no feminine or masculine implica implication, although grammatically it's masculine. The, the secondary name is Ar-Rahman, and the third is Ar-Rahim. Now, both Rahman and Rahim are derived from this root, mercy or compassion, Rahma. Both of them means that which is compassion. But what is it? What is it? First of all, we have to know in Islam there's none compassionate but God. Just as there's no God but God, there's nothing compassionate but God. All compassion is a divine attribute. Listen to the prophet. The prophet put it this way. He said, on the day that God created compassion, he divided it into 100 parts. He kept 99 parts with himself, 
And he sent one part down into the world. Through that one part, mothers take care of their children, and wild animals nurture their young. So compassion is this the, the motherly quality of the divine, the motherly quality of God through which he treats all of his creatures as his own children. This is God's primary attribute. The secondary attributes are attributes such as justice, let's say, because a mother, in order to keep her children in line, of course, has to discipline them. And unfortunately, in much of modern Islam in particular, they've forgotten all about the compassion side, and they try to have justice without compassion. And that, of course, is impossible. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Ibn Arabi because that's the subject of this special conference. So who was uh, Ibn Arabi and um, why is he such an important person to have this conference? So what, about uh, seven, eight hundred, eight hundred 800 or 900 years after he died? Well, it's not that long. Yeah, okay. 700. It's, he, he died in 1240. <clears throat> the, uh, he was... Uh, his importance has to do with the fact that he, he, he lived at a, at, a, at a key point in Islamic history when everything intellectually was coming to a head. All of the schools of Islamic thought, philosophy, theology, jurisprudence, uh, Sufism, had developed uh, you know, in, 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 in great proliferation. Ibn Arabi was an in, both an extremely original thinker and extremely traditional which means that he took all of those grand traditions of Islamic thought, synthesized them, and reformulated them in extremely interesting and, and clever and original ways, such that people who read his books are just are constantly stunned by the way in which he brings out things which, even though you've read that Quranic verse, let's say, 20 times, you've never seen that meaning. But as soon as Ibn Arabi explains that meaning, you see, of course, the verse means that, too. I was always missing it. Now, he's also probably the most prolific author. I mean, he has an enormous number of books, certainly in the Sufi tradition. So he's, and, and, and he became the seedbed for the past 700 years, 600 years of spiritual teaching. He and, of course, there are a number of other key figures, uh, like Rumi. But in terms of his theoretical elaboration, his vision of the whole, no one since has been able to ma match Ibn Arabi's greatness. And he's only recently becoming rediscovered, uh, I would say, in the last 50 years, largely through the efforts of Western scholars. Now, in terms of coming back to our times, um, I suppose a simple question would be, uh, if we could call uh, uh, Ibn Arabi uh, up right now, you and I, what questions would you like to ask him? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the good scholars of Ibn Arabi, Chodkiewicz, is a Frenchman, Michel Chodkiewicz. He has a he has a statement somewhere in his one of his very nice books about Ibn Arabi and his significance. He says. What really caught the imagination of Muslim intellectuals, of intelligent Muslims, about Ibn Arabi is that he has an answer for every question. And so I would say, well, whatever you ask, Ibn Arabi has the answer. The problem is to find where he explains it. He's written so much. But nonetheless, he begins always with first things. And if you can get a hold of that, the, the principles, the underlying roots, then you find usually that your question was not as important as you thought. And it's kind of solved itself if you understand what's going on in the beginning. I, know, I mean this in an ontological and logical sense. What is the origin of reality and what is reality here for? This kind of question. My guest is, <coughs> my esteemed guest is Professor William Chetek at uh, Stony Brook University, Department of Asian and Asian American Studies. Our number is 212-209-2900. Um, I suppose the reason you've not called is you are enthralled, because usually when I ask for you to call, the, f the board lets up, and occasionally it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it is usually is because 
the substance of the presentation of my guest is so deep um, that you have a tendency to say, I would rather listen to my guest than try to ask a question. But when you ask a question, you always, questions are to try to probe the guest's mind. And uh, I never know uh, where the question will take my guest from. So let's see. I think Michael is going to check if we have a caller. And if it is so, we'll take him. Hello, you are on the air. Hello? Yes, you are on the air. Okay, I, I didn't call in because I thought so many people would call in. I'd never get it. I never get a chance. You got it today. So um, I'm finding this fascinating. And I became a Muslim because I, I'm, you know, I was raised Christian. But I was so impressed with the life of Malcolm X and Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali, that um, and other people that I had met who were Muslim. But I do, I do feel that I'm a little. I don't know that I that I um, fit in. I have. I'm older. I'm 70 years old, and I have some health problems and financial problems. So I'm not able to really participate in the in the community in the muslim community and and yet when i hear the program today i just feel so happy and the other day i was i had a very unpleasant situation and found myself instead of coming home i went to the mosque just because i needed to make some type of connection and my question is i i dialed to make to find out about the the november 6th and 7th and I, it's the open center. So my, I'm guessing that it would, the cost is going to be prohibitive for me. So I wondered if there's, is there a book that could be recommended or suggested possibly by uh, Professor Chittick that I'm still a beginner because I don't have the background. Is there a book he could recommend or books? That I would find helpful. I think li just listening to you, you are a Sufi in uh, in your heart, uh, Professor Chidek. Well, I would say there are two books that uh, I always recommend to people. Uh, one is called, which I have a co-author, uh, Sachiko Marata. It's called the the, the, uh, the Vision of Islam. It's the textbook that we use in our introductory courses on Islam uh, at Stony Brook and. Um, the people who take the course, especially the Muslims, are completely astounded because although they've grown up Muslims, they've never heard uh, almost any of this. It's all new to them because, unfortunately, the basic teachings of Islam in most mosques don't get expressed. People are too wrapped up in contemporary issues. So and ideology. Islam is a, is a good place to begin. And then if, you're, if you want to go, I want to go into Sufism. I just want to jump in. You can try my Sufism, a short introduction. Uh, Sufism, a short, a short introduction, or be, a beginner's guide. I think they republished it with a second title. Either it's the same book. Sufism, a beginner's guide. Okay, caller. So here are those two excellent suggestions. Let's take the next caller, Michael G. Hello, you are on the air. Uh, please, uh, how can uh, uh, practicing Sufism on a daily can be um, helpful for the health? Wow, great question. How can Sufism on a day-to-day -day basis be a source of good health? Is that what you said? Okay. Uh, Professor Chittick? Well, I think if you're using Sufism, Sufi practices, which uh, include, of course, the daily prayers that all Muslims uh, perform, but which includes various forms of meditation, if you're using them for your the sake of your health, uh, <laughs> you're, you've got your priorities backwards. Uh, your health is for the sake of, of being in the service of God, not the other way around. God is not in the service of your health. Uh, so uh, I, I, I would rather not, I would say it probably would have good effects because everyone knows that meditation and cutting yourself off from you know the busyness. Of, of, of everyday activity can be very, very helpful, pulling you together and uh, reducing tension. But if that's why you're doing it, uh, don't call it Sufism. Call it, you know, uh, meditation. 
Well, let me make a comment, um, uh, Professor Tudyk. Um, if uh, someone was going to engage in the in the true soul of Sufism and link it with God, Sufis are supposed to be impatient. They want really direct linkage. But I think from that would come a state, a biologic state, where arteries would open up, where you will have better delivery of oxygen, where the oxygen would burn the acids, where oxygen would regulate the or normalize the free radical chemistry. So, in fact, I don't want to digress too much, uh, but our regular listeners know that the single most important uh, practical step that people can take for that physical health would be the breathing. And it so turns out that in all traditions of mysticism and um, enlightenment, breathing has uh, a good part as a start. It starts. The, 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 the goal always is that higher attainment, but you have to do sometimes basic things. Do we have another caller? Okay, let's take the next call. Hello, you are on the air. You are on the air with Professor Chittick. Hello? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir, you are on the air. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just turn the radio. I'll be right back. Please. Yeah, that's something for others to remember, too. Yeah, hi. This is Ron in Norwalk. Hi, Ron. Uh, I have a question. Um, I, I'm very interested in uh, spiritual and philosophical matters. Uh, uh, recently, I've been listening to a lot of Krishnamurti, who I'm sure your guest has probably heard of. It's a different tradition or whatever. But here's my question, and uh, I know you, it's about compassion. And my question is, and I know you said that God practices compassion, so leaving God out of it, just this is just for humans only, is there a superiority involved in compassion. Superiority of whom over whom? Well, in other words, to practice compassion, does it... I, I think my thinking on it is that if I practice compassion to someone, I'm in a position of superiority. In other words, flip it around. If you're a poor person earning $1 a year somewhere and I'm a billionaire, it's not likely, I don't know, maybe it is, that this $1 a year person would look up at a billionaire and uh, feel compassion. Feel compassion for him, but that's a great question. Okay, let's All go right. to Professor Jittick. That's actually a very interesting question because you've raised this issue that on the surface, uh, one person indeed may not be capable of compassion for the other, but I'm sure Professor Jittick is going to have a different answer. Yes, sir. Go on. Um, this is, again, I'm, I'm taking it, coming at it from the Sufi reading of this sort of issue. You can't put God out of the picture. That's like saying, okay, let me remove myself from the midst and we'll t I'll talk objectively. No, no, no. God is present. So we have to remember that the source of all compassion is God. If you think that you are being compassionate and that you deserve some credit for being compassionate, that's not compassion. That is self-interest. Compassion, compassion is selfless. God gives them himself because that's what he does. To be divine in your compassion, to be God, that is to be human in your compassion, because God created man in his own image. We have to be God-like, which means we have to have no attachment whatsoever to the fruit of our compassion. We are compassionate for the sake of compassion. We give of ourselves because it is the fundamental human nature to give of oneself. The man who earns a dollar a year will give what he has, and it's not money I suspect that he can give to the billionaire, but if he should be a compassionate person, the one dollar earner, then the billionaire will see that this man is much happier in life than I am, because I'm still out trying to make acquire. the second billion. I'm still involved with my own ego, and that person has given himself up. I think that that's how I would have answered because this presumption is that a person who has more uh, money somehow is able to practice compassion, which I, I think that many of our listeners would disagree as well. Um, so we have another caller. Let's take that call. Hello, you are on the air. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Dr. Good afternoon, Ali. sir. Hartley and uh, 
a very interesting program. Uh, you may have, or the doctor must have uh, discussed it earlier, but I would like to know where, what's the origin of Sufism, uh, where did it come from, and how long it has been around. Thank you. I'll hang up and listen. Professor Judic. Well, again, as, as we did say at the beginning of the program, Sufism originated with the revelation of the Quran. The first Sufi is the prophet Muhammad. The, na- the word was not used. He was a prophet. But what he did is the model for all authentic Sufism. You know, I'm, I'm so glad, having uh, been born in a Muslim home myself from a Muslim country, Pakistan, I think that this um, clarification, Professor Chirik, is most worthy that Prophet Muhammad was indeed the first Sufi. And when people try to separate the tradition of Sufism from the classical contextual Quranic teaching, that's really a quite a serious error. So I think we can take another call. We have time for another call. Hello, you're on the air. Hello? Yes, sir, you're on the air. Okay. Uh, basically, it's you know I, I don't want to take up a lot of your time, you know, because it's different. You can't, I can't even express what I want to say. But the nature of God, though the though though the gentleman, the the scholarly gentleman that you have as a guest mentions the idea that 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 one cannot even consider uh, existence without the nature of God. This gets us nowhere, you know. If I may say. Like what you what he said, self-interest is what generates humanity. You do so because humanity is the only manner which allows for an environment for you to exist along with others, which you could not exist without. Because you could never capture an animal by yourself. We would be extinct as a species. And all religions are simply enabling, enabling us to bank down our animality, which is the the basic basis of our life, you understand, into a sophisticated behavior, which is humanity. Okay, we do so because we have the brain to do so, but the universe is is so vast, life is so vast, that no God or no book could even have contemplated it, much less had anything to do with it. All right. I think you made your point quite well. In fact, I'm tempted to ask you sometimes get in touch with me because we would like to pursue your line of reasoning, but right now we are close to the end, so I'm going to ask Professor Chittick to respond to you. <coughs> I wasn't asked to uh, deal with contemporary prejudices or contemporary Freudianism or sociological interpretations of religion. I'm quite familiar with the gentleman's position, because it's mainstream, in especially among academic scholars, I was asked to speak on behalf of the Sufi tradition, uh, which begins with the axiom, there is no God but God, which is to say there's nothing real but that which is truly real. And that reality includes consciousness and awareness and infinite wisdom and infinite compassion. That is the starting point, not only of Sufism, but also of Islam and also of Hinduism and also of Christianity and other religions as well. Uh, I think the caller's point was that human reason is all what we have and uh, uh, to, to, to try to make sense of our world yeah. and You know, the problem with, uh, I'll just uh, throw, we are really very short on time, but one of the things that Sufis are very fond of saying is that there was this boy who goes out and he hears a bird singing and then he goes into ecstatic trance and when he comes out of it is 40 years later. Well, I mean, this sort of a thing maybe has some symbolic value, but it clearly um, stretches imagination and you ask yourself what else goes on on the name of Sufism um, which is so alien to our experience because we we humans cannot separate ourselves from a, uh, that sort of experience. My guest is Professor William uh, Chetek. He is um, at the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at the Stony Brook University. More imp- most important, please uh, find time to listen to him in person at this conference, Islam, Sufism, and the Heart of Compassion. He is a keynote speaker. It's at Riverside Church, November 6th and 7th. And uh, 
Uh, we are we have only about one minute, so Professor Chitik, I want to thank you one more time. I might tell our listeners that tomorrow we are going to have Professor Muhammad Haj Yusuf from uh, the Middle East, um, and he is also a speaker at this uh, important conference. So we now have about uh, well, whatever, 40 seconds uh, for your closing comments, and I want to thank you for your time, sir. Uh, I, I would just say I've never heard the story about the bird, but. I have uh, I have read the Quran where it speaks of the seven sleepers of Ephesus who were who were gone for 200 years and then came back. So it's a Quranic story. I mean that is it's a biblical also story. So it's nothing new in the religious mythology. Okay. So thank you again. My guest has been Professor William Chittick, of uh, uh, an author of 30 books. He has just recommended A Vision of Islam as one of the books that he uses for teaching his curriculum. He also mentioned um, a second book. Professor Chirak, you can you give me the title of uh, that second Sufism, book? Sufism, A Beginner's Guide. Sufism, A Beginner's Guide. Thank you very much, Professor Chirak. This has been Science, Health and Healing. Please join us tomorrow to continue this discussion with Professor Muhammad Haji Yusuf. Until then, may you be gracious and graceful and generous in your spirit.